Good evening. It's uh, great to be here, and, and I'm happy to see you all. Um, and I'm happy to be here with uh, both these fine, fine activists, women, uh, fighters. Uh, I want to I want to begin by reaching back, um, just for a minute, um, before coming forward, uh, to arrive at who we are in the room, um, survivors of the crossing. Uh, a few years ago, I went to the door of no return. Angela was on that trip too. About nine of us went to the door of no return. <clears throat> and I want to just read you a little piece that I wrote about that experience. And that's my way of going back to come forward. When I finally arrived at the door of no return, there was an official there, a guide who was a man in his ordinary life. It was December. We had brought a bottle of rum. Some ancient ritual we remembered from nowhere and no one. We stepped one behind the other as usual. The castle was huge, opulent. Have some of you been there yet? To one of those? Yeah. We went like pilgrims. We were pilgrims. This is the holiest we ever were. The only gods we had were in the holding cells. We awakened our gods, and we left them there since we never needed gods again. We did not have wicked gods, so they understood. They lay in their corners on their disintegrated floors. They lay on their walls of skin dust. They stood when we entered, happy to see us. Our guide said, this was the prison for the men. This was the prison cell for the women. I wanted to strangle the guide, as if he were the original guide. Yet, in the rooms, the guide was irrelevant. The gods woke up, and we felt pity for them, and affection, and love. They felt happy for us. We were still alive. Yes, we are alive, we said. And we had returned to thank them. You are still alive, they said. Yes, we are still alive. They looked at us like violet. Like violet teas, they drank us. We said, here we are. They said, you are still alive. We said, yes. Yes, we are still alive. How lemon, they said. How blue, like fortune. We took the bottle of rum from our veins. We washed their faces. We sewed their thin skins. We were pilgrims. They were gods. They said with wonder and admiration, you are still alive, like oxygen, like hydrogen. We all stood there for some infinite time. We did weep. But that is nothing in comparison. So we are still alive. Yeah. I think it is important to note that. It is a blinding and magnificent fact that we are still alive in this hemisphere. How we are here and how we survived being here and how we continue to survive in this moment is what this evening is about. Um, it occurred to me when preparing for the panel how crucial every act of speaking is in the lives of black people, how crucial every public forum is, what is at stake and what is always at stake in these acts of speech. What is always at stake are the grounds of our survival and our liberation. It's the oddest thing, right? We meet in these rooms and we are actually talking about our actual liberation, not in some uh, theoretical way or some hypothetical way, but in practical and meaningful ways. 
necessary and critical ways. I recall back in the 80s, I think it was 83, at the first screening of that film, Home Feeling, a struggle for a community by Jennifer Hodge and Roger McTeer. And after the screening, and it was a, a, a film about Jane Finch, and after the screening, members of the audience rose to ask, uh, what do we do? <laughs> what is our next action? Asking the filmmakers, what organization were they going to begin to deal with the problems exposed in the film? Um, the black people in this country find ourselves each day in a state of hypervigilance, of having to organize against the ongoing attacks on our existence, on the everydayness of the conditions of inequality, the matter-of-factness of presumed harm we will come to. And in the face of this, we see the ongoing fight, the ongoing fight back of black people on the micro and macro levels in the society. So I want to invite Angela and Robin to give us their sense, uh, their analysis of this particular moment um, about their own activism, uh, the work that they do every day to make our lives livable. So Angela and Robin, give us the news from the front line. <laughs> All right, so we're addressing back, you see. Yes. <laughs> Give us the news from the front line. Um, do you want to go first? Sure. Yeah. Um, so, one, just wanting to say thank you for being in this community. Um, I see folks um, in this room um, who um, we have been and continue to be part of that everyday activism. And I believe that just by being here, in this conversation is part of that everyday activism and that it is an act of critical resistance to be in a space, in a community of black folks and allies naming the presence and the prevalence of racism in our lives. So thank you as well to um, Jean Augustine for enabling this space to be possible, to sponsors Unifor um, because we know that there is a union advantage for racialized workers, particularly women. Thank you to the Faculty of Education and Humanities as well. Thanks for continually grounding the work that takes place in the academy with the material reality of people and communities we seek to work with and support and continually reminding us that our work is to use our roles and our voice to be agents of just social change through activism and resistance, particularly in this neoliberal moment that would suggest that such actions are no longer needed, they're not valid, or they're not effective. Thanks for using this Black History Month gathering in naming the presence of anti-black racism and the persistence and the persistent way in which it operationalizes itself in this multicultural Canada. Um, locating self, important always, came here as a child. Um, my mother came here as a domestic worker, and I grew up with grandmothers as part of that early thing around globalization. And one of the early activism that I became aware of was the action that some of you in this room may have been a part of, um, good enough to work, good enough to stay, which is where women who came here as domestic workers who were not being given their landed status, and there was a mobilization that happened that enabled me to be here. As I begin this conversation, I think it's important for us to acknowledge that the history of European settlement in Canada is marred by the genocide and exploitation of indigenous peoples, the theft of their land and the continuing violence of their marginalization. In the wake of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, we must never forget that the constellation of indigenous peoples' dispossession is based on legal construct and encoded in legislation. It is not accident. It did not just happen because we have bad people. It happened because it was structured. We must recognize that indigenous people with marginalization, 
was deliberately manufactured. As immigrants in this room, particularly those of us who came under the promise of multiculturalism, we must recognize that the promise of multiculturalism held in it the erasure of indigenous people and brought with it explicit divisions where the state promised immigrants as more desired than the indigenous people whose lands we were brought to. I must also underscore that through the transatlantic slave trade, African peoples were forcibly brought here as stolen people on a stolen land. Hence the need for all of us who came after, who seek to work for social justice in this country, to be in solidarity and in alliance with indigenous peoples' fight for land and social change. I would say this must be a site of every, our everyday activism to name colonization, to publicly support indigenous peoples' activism, to challenge and change all that would seek to erase them and us. I believe activism and critical resistance are necessary for our survival, our sanity, our joy, our under and our survivance under what bell hooks called white supremacist capitalist patriarchy. We see the manifestation of this in the rise and the rates of poverty of racialized communities in the disparities of income for racialized workers, the widening gap, education achievement gap for black youth in our high schools, the high school rates and the high rates of incarceration of black and indigenous children in the child welfare system, the high rates of poverty of transgendered community individuals, people with disabilities, in the crushing inequalities faced by indigenous communities, in the targeting and prevalence of regulated carding of young black bodies by the police, the disproportionate representation of black and indigenous men in the prison industrial complex, the continuing income gap and the widening income gap between men and women, between racialized women and white women, in the high rates of violence against women, the murder and missing indigenous women, in the high rates of unemployment among young people, the widening gap between the rich and the poor, and the related prevalence of class politics. We don't talk about class no more. We need to talk about class. And the persistent presence and continuing presence of racism, homophobia, transphobia, ableism, Islamophobia, just to name the things that we encounter in this city called Toronto. Where in the city just last week, we heard that wearing a do-rag to school mm -hmm. is a suitable marker for affirming Black History Month. Where last year, just late last year in November, when a six-year-old black girl was handcuffed at the ankles first and then the wrists by Peel police and removed from the school for being out of control, and that since the age of four, that child has been suspended four times from her school with the police being called twice. These are things that disturbs us, that must disturb us, that demand our everyday activism, not just in naming, but in taking action to interrupt. This contemporary moment we occupy is one where, to paraphrase scholar present Ronaldo Walcott in his book, Black Like Who? Blackness is now everywhere in the city of Toronto, but black people are nowhere. And I don't mean nowhere in terms of place and position. Yeah? I mean that we are, and, and in terms of geography, um, I mean that we are nowhere being thought of by the system as valued in any meaningful way. And as my partner would say, you can go into any cafe and hear the music, our music, but nobody wants to hear us, yes? The enormity of the task ahead and the many sites of oppression and injustice are acknowledged but so too, I believe, Dion, are the great promises contained in individual and collective activism and resistance to vision and create the society we want. Doing and visioning of something other than this is critical resistance and activism. This is why we need to make cultural producers and we need to support them because they vision what we cannot see or do 
and they can make us feel our liberation and justice. In closing, activism and critical resistance is not just about responding to the injustice. It is also about critical reflection before we make the next move and after we have acted. Because our movement and our organizing can become fragmented. We can become arrogant. We can be made celebrities and then can create vulnerabilities in our movements, which will be exploited by white supremacist capitals, patriarchy. In closing, my approach is that to everyday activism and critical resistance is that your struggle for justice must be my struggle for justice because there is no justice in achieving access, equity for some, and leaving inequality in the path of others. So that is my opening homage to this moment and this gathering. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. I mean, thank you, Dion, for your for your questions. And I just really want to say um, thanks. I was so honored to get this email from Carl James inviting me to this event. And I just want to express my gratitude as well to Unifor, to the Faculty of Education and Humanities, um, and to Jean Augustine as well for really making this event possible. I think that we are still very much in a moment when talking about the there is a there is a real meaning and value to Black History Month month, which is also to me Black Futures Month. Um, something that we use, I think, to ground ourselves, even really, we can do this through this concept of everyday activism and critical resistance as a way of grounding ourselves um, both in our shared histories and in the ways that we are geared, to, geared toward the future. So I thought that I would share and open today with some thoughts about where we have come from and where we are going in the struggle for black liberation. And I'm relatively young. Um, this is an intergenerational discussion that I'm really happy to be a part of. Uh, so, so much of where we have come from, what I have learned, I've learned from discussions with my elders. I've learned from combing through the archives of books, of newspapers, of master's theses, of traces left by the generation before. Oh, my hair. One second. We'll do this. <clears throat> so, that's actually no small feat given the broader climate of continual erasure and the ongoing erasure of black life in this country. This means that it actually takes an enormous amount of dedication to find our stories, despite the brilliant inroads, of course, of black scholars who have lovingly recorded our histories um, and left traces and left a mark. So this learning of where we have come as a black woman living in Canada, for me, has been enormously facilitated even by the two of you that I'm sitting with today. Um, I continually reread, actually, the pages of Our Lives, Canada's first black women's newspapers. I continually reread um, your We're Rooted Here and You Can't Pull Us Up. Um, I think that it really brought those, those works really brought the everyday activism of black women um, into my purview, into many of our purviews, and have in many ways grounded um, the moment that we find ourselves today in what I really believe is a black feminist resurgence. Um, I actually found a quote from you, Angela, but I hope you don't mind me reading from your speech from International Women's Day in 1989, because I think that actually really grounds us and shows us the trajectories of what we are struggling for now and how similar it actually was and how many of the actions that you were both a part of um, a few decades earlier have really paved the way to the present. So you, you said, lesbians are harassed by the police. Blacks and people of color are brutalized and killed. Why is it that the police can shoot and kill a 17-year-old black youth with a bullet to the back of the head, but cannot find a rapist in Scarborough who has repeatedly hunted and attacked women over the last several months. We demand change. Now Bernardo. that, could, and that could have been written last week, mm. right? So I think we really need to give this credit in really grounding our histories in the you know the forebearers of the struggle that we are in today. And your words and actions have left a clear mark. Um, and it was a gift for me discovering a black feminism that preceded my own, that was at once unapologetic queer, deeply critical of the multiple systems of oppression that we as black women face, policing, immigration policy, a capitalism that is once racial and gendered. Um, this work and the work you both continue to do uh, in the present has profoundly shaped my own activism and so many others in this room, whether we're aware of it or not, in terms of our activism, our scholarship, our organizing, and even personal lives. I think as writers more broadly, uh, as black writers in particular, leaving a mark is quite political in a place that is deliberately tried to erase and distort any trace of blackness. Um, 
Catherine Kidrick points out in her recent work that almost all black Canadian writers also have to wrestle with this idea of a relative invisibility. And this is accepting, of course, for what I actually like to call um, the fake news, the real fake news, because mm -hmm. people often talk about this sort of new era that we're in right now as one that um, suddenly there's this fake news that is uh, undermining the legitimate government. But as we know for black people, the fake news has been directed against us for a long time, which has often been our only access to visibility. So I think about the Globe and Mail in the 1980s talking about you know, Jamaican gangs as Uzi-toting thug, um, thugs who are gonna bring the drug that would turn children into thieves. That's some actual quote from, I believe, McLean's magazine. We know the fake news of the welfare crisis in the 1990s that targeted Somali single moms for supposedly stealing hundreds of thousands of dollars to import, uh, to send money back to Somali warlords. We know, um, and we know that this fake news was actually done with uh, the support of the government. It wasn't something that was undermining governments. This is something that was done with state control. We saw, you know, the undermining of the Black Action Defense Committee. Um, we saw the undermining of black activism in the media as well as by the government in black activism in Halifax in the 1960s as well. The fake news was also part of justifying what, what ended up justifying the deportation, you know, of 500 uh, Jamaicans just in the year, uh, in 1995. But when it comes to the visibility of black people as human beings, that is where we have, <laughs> that is where we continue to struggle. But I do think that where we are today is we're actually moving into a different moment of legibility. Um, in black struggle, we're moving into, I feel that there's very much a rhetorical shift underway and that blackness is being reconfigured in the Canadian landscape. Now, of course, this is something that is the result, of course, of decades of black struggle. Um, beginning, you know, in the, in the 1970s and really bringing us to now, but we really are at a tipping point in some ways of visibility, where, of course, Justin Trudeau just last week um, finally recognized the existence of anti-black racism, um, something that I think we were supposed to be grateful for, although it really just is something that actually confirmed a basic fact of black existence in this country. Um, and I think that, you know, there is a symbolic value in that I think it really demonstrates how far we have come as black activists and we've been able to force this issue into the public realm. But I think this new era of visibility also presents us with different challenges and different risks as well. It's great to have it recognized that anti-blackness is a fact and not a fiction, but it also, as notions of black excellence continue to be co-opted now, I think, on the political level, um, you know, we have a black immigration, immigration minister who's set to possibly oversee one of the largest mass deportations of black folks from Canadian soil in recent history. Um, you know, Haitian members of parliament being paid by the Canadian government to, tell, to go to the United States and tell Haitians not to come to Canada. So whether black visibility is on the radar, that doesn't necessarily mean that black lives mm -hmm. matter. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't necessarily mean the transformative shift in the way that our society continues to, um, to be organized. And I think we have many lessons to learn from the decolonization movement uh, and the ongoing colonial realities in the Caribbean, um, in, the United, in, in South Africa, in the United States, that we know that black prison guards, black police, black heads of state is not a stand in for justice for black people. And in some ways it makes black liberation struggle more complex. Mm -hmm. And this is something that we need to continue to think through as black communities today. Um, Kianga Yamada Taylor wrote in her book, um, Black, From Black Lives Matter to Black Liberation, uh, she was writing this book under the Obama era, and I think she wrote mm -hmm. something that was very helpful where she says, the challenge, of course, will be from recognizing black humanity to changing the institutions responsible for its degradation. So what does that really mean for us today to challenge the institutions that have created, maintained, upheld, and condoned black oppression four centuries into the present? Um, when now we sort of have a moment where the state is both complicit in historically and presently devaluing black lives, but is also positioning itself as a friendly ally to black liberation. As black folks in this country, we've often mostly researched ourselves in order to have our own realities reflected at all, but now it's becoming sort of profitable and fashionable to actually display um, black suffering, to say that black lives matter. Um, so I think that these are the questions we need to ask ourselves of how can we create struggles that cannot and will not be um, co-optable, what does it mean to sort of move forward um, in, into something that is more than just um, integration that actually moves into what it would mean to have black emancipation. Mm -hmm. Black feminist struggles have often had liber liberatory goals that are far broader um, than this idea of integration. So really that means, I think th these are the questions we need to ask ourselves both as we ground ourselves in our history and as we project ourselves mm -hmm. into the future. Um, and a time like Black History Month and Black Futures Month, I think is a really important time to do this. 
So I'm really looking forward to showing this evening with uh, Tami, who are two of the OGs of Black Canadian feminism. Um, that so OG. yeah, thank you guys. Hey, what, <laughs> I always wonder, I wonder now if that means all girls. Oh, the, uh, what, what, does, that, does that mean all guard? No, I think it's all gangster. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's all gangster. Um, you, you both raised a number of a number of really kind of Im, 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 a, a lot of important things you've said there. You know, um, I want to know. Let's talk about some of the institutions that have an impact on. Uh, black people's lives, and Angela, as you so rightly point out, um, indigenous people's lives, um, not, not coincidentally, but, but together, really. Um, you know, the ways in which those lives are managed, um, whether it's the uh, Angela, you work in healthcare. Um, um, Robin, you've done a, a lot of anti-policing work. Angela, you also. Um, give me your take on, on some of those institutions and how they impact, um, and how they impact black people's lives. Uh, you know, most recently, I'm, I'm thinking of the, the 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 well, the killings of of, of black people for one, like Abdi Rahman Abdi and Pierre Corey Alain, and the um, incarceration and threatened deportation of Abdu Abdi, et cetera. Um, those are, the, those are the, the glaring ones, and there are, there are both like um, highly institutionalized and highly random. Um, impact on, on black people's lives, and I, so, from, from the point of view of living in the cities that you do live in, tell me what, what the situation is there in, insofar as those things. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I live in Montreal mm -hmm. um, for now. I've lived there for most of my adult life. Um, Montreal, uh, we often, I think, there's a lot of focus on the realities of black communities in Toronto and a lot of visibility. Um, and it is one of, you know, the city with the largest black population in Canada. There's also sort of some recognition of the black existence of black communities in Halifax because of really just the long-standing legacy of slavery mm -hmm. in the maritime provinces um, and the, you know, the vocal nature of the black community there. But I find uh, living in black Montreal, which is actually home to the second largest population, black population in Canada, um, mm -hmm. the conditions and the realities of black folks actually living in Montreal often go um, under, sort of under-recognized and unseen. Mm -hmm. For example, I remember I was talking after Pierre Coriolan was mm -hmm. killed uh, the last summer, I was talking to, uh, to Desmond Cole about it, and we, I was like, you should write an op-ed about this. And he was like, oh, I actually pitched an op-ed um, uh, to a major Canadian newspaper, but they said, oh, we actually haven't covered it as a story, so you can't write an opinion piece about it. And I think mm -hmm. that's very telling in a moment, you know, when we're seeing, like, the deaths of Alton Sterling, of Philando Castile, playing this sort of, you know, that was an mm -hmm. hour on the hour news cycle, but we can't even have an opinion piece about the death mm -hmm. of Pierre Coriolan after he dies until, you know, what we ended up having to organize, which was sort of a massive demonstration outside of where he was killed, but ended up marching to, um, to take over one of the stages at Jazz Fest. And then it became news because it was impossible for it to not become news. So I think there really is just this, the existence of Black Montreal and the kinds of anti-Black racism that have existed there, I mean, for centuries, where actually the first enslaved Black person was brought, which is a very important part of um, Black history and the legacy of anti-Blackness is something that, um, I think is more important to sort of bring to these broader discussions outside mm -hmm. of the city. So Montreal North, which is actually home to Montreal's largest portion of uh, black folks, is home to the highest rate of child poverty in Quebec. Um, and in an area where carding is extremely endemic, like in just 2006, 2007, almost 40% of all black youth were actually stopped by the police in just that one year uh, versus like 5%, uh, I forget if it was 5 or 10% mm -hmm. of white youth. Um, what after is that figure again? Say that figure again. So 40% of all black youth in just one year were stopped by the police in this one neighborhood. Oh, okay. yeah. um, so that's something that's, ma that's happening on a massive scale. Mm -hmm. And those numbers were actually only released to us because um, the police had actually done an internal report that was accidentally leaked to the media. Mm -hmm. They've since claimed that racial profiling is over, 
um, but not released any statistics to prove that or to back that up. Mm -hmm. um, the, and the absolute level, I think, of dehumanization is ongoing. For example, after Bonnie Jean Pierre was killed, who was a Haitian man in his 40s who was killed in a very minor drug bust that uncovered tiny amounts of drugs, he was shot at close range with rubber bullets. Um, after he was killed, the, the mayor spoke to the media and said, let's not be too, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, I actually have the exact words. Uh, yes, he said, we must be careful, this is a gang member, when people were talking about the possibility of racism um, mm -hmm. in, in Montreal. And of course, ni since 1987, um, black people have been killed, or have made up 15% of police killings and are only 8% of the population. So I think, you know, something I realized when I was researching my book, though, is that while racism is articulated differently in different parts of the country, um, for example, there's a lot less tokenistic gestures um, given towards, say, black communities um, in, in Quebec, where it's sort of, in, it's not the same as that sort of English culture that likes to recognize and then not change racism. Mm -hmm. But what, I, what you realize um, in doing the kind of research that I was doing was that whichever city you're looking at, however white supremacy is articulated, mm -hmm. um, you see you know, the same rates in Montreal as you find elsewhere in terms of the disproportionate removal, the heightened surveillance of black youth um, in the child welfare system, um, the grossly disproportionate you know, um, ex expulsions and suspensions in schools, the low graduation rate, um, they won't release the number of, of black folks in provincial jails, but there's no reason to believe that it's different than other parts of the country, for example. Um, and you even, you know, behind bars, for example, you have Arlene Gallon, who's a black woman who I've been active in supporting, who was actually held in solitary confinement for six months in a prison in Quebec, who's now actually suing Correctional Services Canada. So I think really everywhere you go, you have really similar conditions of state violence, of state neglect, of state hostility. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's see. So I think in terms of, um, for me here in Toronto, what we've seen is we've seen a recent kind of unmasking of um, we want to pride ourselves as being quite cosmopolitan, this mm -hmm. place called Toronto, um, and um, more advanced um, in our um, commitment to delivering on this thing called equity. You know, we have the city's motto is diversity, our strength, or diversity is, you know, yeah, mm -hmm. diversity, our strength. Yet, it's also in the same city when we look at institutions, so Ministry of um, Children and Youth, where we see that over 40% of <laughs> kids in care um, in the children's aid um, system are from black communities. Um, it's also the same system that we should not forget that we had a mother risk program that was being led out of Sick Kids Hospital, which is a program that was geared to support mothers who were struggling, um, who felt that they may need some support around substance use, and really what it was done, and it was offered as a support. It wasn't offered as a support around substance use, it was offered as a support for, in terms of young mothers, mothers who were struggling. But what it ended up doing was really targeting mm -hmm. black and racialized and low income poor white women. Mm -hmm. So this is the complexion of who were targeted and who and which which then connects back to our overrepresentation in this children's aid um, society system. Mm -hmm. So the other piece that I think that this we, we see in this Toronto um, is the fact that more and more we have seen the spaces that black communities occupied. So the Regent Park, mm -hmm. the Lawrence Heights, um, the Eglinton, mm -hmm. the Bathurst Street. Where are, these are the spaces, the geographies of the city that we mm -hmm. called home, mm -hmm. that we could go to find each other. That those spaces are, and those were lands and spaces that were not particularly valued, yeah, because people wanted to move out to Woodbridge. Mm -hmm. They wanted to move out to Richmond Hill. Um, but these are spaces now that have become prime real estate. And as a result, then the black bodies have been moved off those mm -hmm. spaces. Those spaces are being redeveloped, but not redeveloped for us. So, you know, my partner and I laugh ironically, always talking about the fact that, so why is it that redevelopment can't mean redevelopment for poor people? Mm -hmm. 
Why is it that redevelopment must always mean, quote unquote, mixed community? And when we hear that language, mm -hmm. we need to be very attuned that it means a relocation of black and brown mm -hmm. bodies out of the center. Mm -hmm. And this is now what has happened. So we have seen, I think back to the comment about, you know, we're here, but nowhere. Um, so, 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 so and, and then also what I think that relates to is the fact that we as racialized folks, when we look at the income um, disparities, is that we're overrepresented in low income categories. But yet people who are low income, we know are spending more than 50% of their income on housing. Mm -hmm. And we are at the same time being moved out of the margins of the, um, out of the center of the city mm -hmm. to the margins where our costs then increase to even get back into the city mm -hmm. where we work, yeah? Um, and as well then we have these things in the system, in the healthcare system called catchment, yeah? So I work in the sector, in the community health center sector where when brown bodies and black bodies were in the center, we said, you know, your catchment is Regent Park, your catchment is Unison, which is Lawrence Heights. So mm -hmm. therefore, you will have access to these centers. We still have catchment, but our brown bodies no longer exist mm. in those geographies. So in our healthcare system, I would say we need, there are some things we need to disband with because they're in fact systems that were designed to support us are no systems that are hurting us. Mm -hmm. the, <coughs> Last piece, but not quite, because I want us to really kind of come back to it. I went to the ROM. They have that brilliant, um, lovely interruption, one would say they are seeking to do. Mm -hmm. um, here we are here, black Canadian contemporary art. Mm -hmm. And because you asked about institution, for me it's about the, um, the cultural institution. So we have the Ram who is seeking to atone for the wrong that they did to us with um, Into the Heart of Africa. And so I, I, I was in the, 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 thir the Thursday gathering, is the, the, the Thursday party, no? Is it the th third Friday first? I forget the third. Something like that. Friday Night Live. Friday Night Live, yes? Mm -hmm. And I was moved, yes? I was moved because there was so much of us in the space. We were present, we were lovely, we were joyous. And you know, we rarely get to see ourselves as full human beings in joy. Mm -hmm. And that for me was beautiful. But at the same time, I was disturbed because I have a feeling that we were being used. Mm -hmm. I have a feeling that we were nothing more than a bit of a decorative addition to the space to signify something about their progress, but at the mm -hmm. substance of it, it changes nothing for us. Mm -hmm. Because we were so present in the space, but nothing in the space where we were, the ground atrium space, mm -hmm. it still had the fossilized, the dinosaur bones mm -hmm. as the key features. So it didn't have us. We were in the space, but we were not in the space. But, I, but then I also saw that the the exhibition had, when you talk about history, Dion, and looking mm -hmm. back to look forward, it had Sylvia Hamilton's piece, which mm -hmm. is the scrolls with the names and sometimes no names, just the description of our black bodies that were sold, um, you know, stout gal, mm -hmm. strong, good teeth, strong arms. And that for me was the anchoring mm -hmm. in that exhibition. Yeah. But in every review that I think I've read that have come out, there is a, a historical presentation of our lives in that space. And I think these are the things that should disturb us because the institutions are really moving to co-opt um, equity um, mm -hmm. to signify their, um, their, their, their progress on these issues and our bodies are in the space being called upon as signifiers mm -hmm. of that. But at mm -hmm. the core of it, I really believe nothing has changed and that when we are in those spaces, that we really need to be in the space with that critical resistance to demand more than a Thursday night or a one night presence, but 
I'll, I'll go on about that, but I, I you know, I'm, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I hear you. Um, I, you know, we're in a particularly interesting moment because there is this, clearly there's this kind of white supremacy has come to power in the West, mm -hmm. yeah? Fully, mm -hmm. I shouldn't say it has come to mm -hmm. power, it was always in power, always in power, but, but explicitly and at its most virulent anti-black. Yes for the last, whatever, 50 years or so, right? Um, and, and at the same time, and at the same time, as you say, this kind of employment or deployment mm -hmm. of a kind of blackness as a sign of, 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 of equity, yes. as a sign of a cosmopolitan society. And as you point out, these populations are being pushed to the, to the borders of whiteness, in a sense. Mm -hmm. So in this city, for example, and I'm sure in Montreal, there's a white core in, in the center of the city, more and more, um, even as we are deployed as, as signs of something, yes. signs of progress or signs of equality or something. Um, but, but this virulent anti-blackness that has now um, gained an, an extraordinary momentum mm -hmm. in a time when we thought that we've done so much work to undercut mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. right? Um, mm -hmm. I think it's not, it, it's not coincidental in a way, but it's also, so it's this kind of in, incredible white supremacy that is underwritten by liberal democracy mm -hmm. Right? So um, black people and people of color get the promise of um, some things called justice, the possibility of, of justice. Um, even as we thought that we were at this sort of profound moment of, of, of possible liberation, it's a, it's a really interesting Fragile mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. fragile moment. Mm -hmm. What am I saying? An answer yes. that. Yes. No, and you see, yeah. So no, I'm with you yes. because this is this is also the moment where we get the anti-racism secretariat. Yes. Secretariat, yes. not directorate. Is it directorate? Secretariat. Secretariat. Yeah. Yes. Um, and I believe that our everyday act of resistance and critical resistance and activism is that we must be eternally suspicious. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We must be eternally suspicious because any time I believe we are about to turn the corner to push for a new vision of what we want, then we are presented with something that would seek, I think, to mute our resistance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that calls us or to, to curate be, it. To cu yes, 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 yes. Yeah. And people would object to yeah. me using the word curate, the curators <laughs> in the room. Okay. Because <laughs> you know, we're curating yes. food, we're curating everything now. <laughs> um, yeah. But it, 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 it calls, but, but we're presented. So, so we're at this moment of incredible resistance mm -hmm. with Black Lives Matter movement mm -hmm. that has pushed and yes. has pushed the system to the edge of having to give something. Um, and what we want is we want to, and we are demanding a new vision about how we want to be in this, in the space, in the space, in the city, in the system. Um, and what we, what, a new system. We want a new system. Mm -hmm. That's what we're saying. We want a new system. We don't want to tinker with this. We want a new system. Mm -hmm. But then the system quickly gives us, it pivots quickly and it gives us these things. Mm -hmm. So we have a minister of immigration who right. is himself a man who came here as a refugee who is now about to send many of us back. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. We have um, the anti-racism <coughs> directorate, um, secretariat, that is housed by you know, folks with our bodies, brown bodies, who is saying to us that they're going to deliver some real change. Mm -hmm. But we have been here before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We were here before with the black directorate, the anti-black or the black secretary, the black 
you know, the, the, yeah. they, they just keep changing the name. What the yeah. hell was the other one? <laughs> yeah. Yes. The black secretariat? No, the black secretariat? No, there was something else. Anti-racism directorate? No. <laughs> so, yeah. so, so this is how they confuse us. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> right? But it hasn't changed. It has not changed. And I'm saying that we should not invest ourselves in these places because it doesn't hold tremendous promise for us. And mm -hmm. that when we engage them, that we must always engage them critically and with suspicion. Mm -hmm. And that if we seek to engage them, that we are in there having a conversation because we see ourselves as infiltrators. So, so I, so, so, so my part, you know, so back to, you know, in terms of the piece around everyday resistance is I see myself and the spaces that I occupy in conversation with these spaces as an infiltrator um, in that I'm not committed to your project. I have a different mm -hmm. project. I may need to enter to find out what it is that you're up to so mm -hmm. that I can go home and tell my people. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Because I think they, and they will call up on us, and this is where class enters the picture, mm -hmm. is they will call up on us to be in these spaces to be the one and only. Yep. Yep. To be the ones who can be reasonable, to reason with the system, the ones who they can talk to at a board meeting. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Um, and we can be seduced by that. And we can be delusional. About well, that. we can be delusional, yes. yes. <laughs> But I think we yeah. can also get yeah. seduced yeah. because we also come from places where we have not had, mm -hmm. yeah? Where we have not been heard, where we have not been given space, where we have sought to claim some space to make decisions and or to have influence. Mm -hmm. And white supremacy will continually seduce us with those spaces. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I think our everyday act of critical resistance is to always go into those spaces being suspicious and to always go into those spaces occupying the space as an infiltrator. Mm -hmm. yeah. So talk some more about, you've begun to talk about it there. Um, you know, there are political and social differences among black people, mm -hmm. right? Um, there's the tendency to, 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 to think about us, and, and, and we have it too, as, as kind of monolithic, but we're not. Uh, there are all kinds of political and social differences among us. Um, the one thing we are alert to, of course, is racism. Yeah? Yeah. Um, how we want that to, 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 to work out um, points to some of the things you've been saying about how you get called into these places. Um, talk a little bit about how you see those things, those political and social differences kind of breaking down. Because we're not all, as I, as I facetiously said, delusional. Some of us are involved, mm -hmm. yeah, and as you say, seduced. Um, how do you see those breaking down in the fight for liberation? How do those differences, as well as others, impact what you see as the challenges we have in terms of black organizing? I know that's a big, big question. And mm -hmm. any of these questions is not a question to answer tonight. It's a question mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. just thinking about, yeah. just, just yeah. consideration, right? Absolutely. So talk a little bit well, to that. I think that's a really important question because anti-black racism, as much as it is monolithic, we don't experience it in a monolithic way because, I mean, particularly in a country like Canada where you have you know, half of black folks that live here have been born elsewhere, but also that means born elsewhere means continental Africa, it means the Caribbean, it means France, it really, you know, it has, a, we have significant di uh, backgrounds, uh, wildly different backgrounds and wildly different experiences. And often, you know, for many uh, of us that migrate here, for example, for my parents, that experience even of being hailed as black only begins when we enter Canada, that experience of sort of that visceral anti-black racism that is very different if you come from a black country. Um, so I think that what that means is that there is a particular uniformity in the way that, of course, we're assumed to be criminal, uh, pathological, less sentient, the way that our kids are treated at schools, regardless of our class backgrounds. 
um, that really sort of exceeds and surpasses those differences. But I think that um, it's really if we look to what it means to actually identify those differences in the black experience that actually is possibly, I mean, divisive, but also gives us more of our strengths, right? So if we're able to actually, for example, identify the way that Islamophobia is also a part of the experience for many Somali people living in Canada, if we can actually look to the particular and unique experiences, for example, of transgender women who in many ways experience some of the most extreme kinds of police violence, certainly that I've witnessed in my own work as an outreach worker, um, we know, for example, that poor black women experience some of the most acute hardships. Um, you know, we often privilege um, the way that young black men are, pro are profiled by the police, but we don't look at the multi-systemic way that, for example, a poor black woman is subject to surveillance and hostility from the child welfare agencies, from social service workers, that there is actually a far broader kind of oppression if we focus our energy differently. So what that actually allows us, if we choose, um, to actually focus on those of us that are most marginalized in a variety of ways, um, whether that's being undocumented, for example, and being subject or um, being afraid of being subject to, for example, indefinite detention, that actually also gives us a much broader and more accurate front of us to actually, as activists in our everyday movements, to actually attend to the broad array of ways that anti-black racism manifests itself in our society. Mm -hmm. So I think that although you know, the experiences, for example, of like a queer black girl in school are really different than of like a Jamaican homeless man, for example, right? But you can still see that all of those experiences actually shed light on a different way that anti-blackness is articulated. So I think if we're really able to move back, move past this kind of respectability politics that tells that there are certain kinds of acceptable victims mm -hmm. and that there are other kinds of black people who's, who's um, you know, who are exposed to hardships, who somehow are, be, are said to deserve it, if we can really move past that kind of respectability politics and really understand the vast diversity of experiences of anti-black racism and really center the margins mm -hmm. of those black folks within our communities, I think that will actually, in the end, possibly give us a much stronger way to actually combat these everyday kinds mm -hmm. of oppression that we're facing. So I think it's both something that has the possibility to divide us as a community, but if we really just go deep, mm -hmm. I think that's actually something that we're going to have to attend to yeah. because of the makeup of this country that is you know, particularly unique. Uh, in many ways, so. Yeah. To understand the kind of permutations of, of anti-blackness across, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, I, I, and, and for this I, I, I bring kind of Kimberly Crenshaw um, in terms of, you know, intersectionality and call upon that as a way for us to think about our organizing. Um, because I remember, um, you know, I, I still think I'm young, but, you know, I. You've been told. I've been told that it's not, <laughs> that's not the case. <laughs> um, yeah. that, when, um, that when, you know, I was, you know, younger mm -hmm. and in the Black Women's Collective is that what we brought in our analysis was this, um, the, we, we subscribed to the notion and the language around intersectionality, that we cannot struggle as black women without looking at issues around income and income inequality, that we cannot be disconnected from issues around labor mm -hmm. and how labor, how our labor gets organized and or not organized. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, so, so I think if we bring that lens to our organizing, then it holds more promise for us in terms of um, holding a common vision. I think that one of the pieces that I have learned, certainly, and you know, this is where I would say then I'm older now, is the value of reflection and the value of um, a, a critical reflection of our organizing. Mm -hmm. That sometimes we, when we act, we also need to step back and think about, okay, so did that strategy work? Mm -hmm. Did it not work? Who was included? Who was left out? What is it that we need to do differently? Um, because that's also, for me, learning from history. Because we have seen and we have critiqued other movements that excluded us, mm -hmm. um, that excluded LGBTQ community, black women. Um, and so if we, so, if, so, so I think we, I think we, what we need to do is embed the notion of critical reflection um, in our movements um, as a part of the project. Mm -hmm. 
not as something that we do when there's a crisis, <laughs> but that's something that is just part of the core of how we organize. And I think that will help to um, quickly respond to those contentions. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the other piece that I think we also need to um, just name um, is back to the issue of class. Because class sometimes is what will be, and, um, and, and some of our desire to be in particular location in relationship to, um, in terms of class aspirations, is what will sometimes just divide where we stand. And that's okay, because we may not all sit under the same umbrella, but we also need to know where we sit, and we need to look to say, okay, that's where you are, this is where I am. And therefore, I may know that you may not be part of my movement. And that has to be OK. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because I think sometimes we spend an inordinate amount of energy trying to, um, trying to bring a common strategy. And sometimes you just end up wasting your time. Mm -hmm. Because some people have subscribed to white capitalist patriarchy. Mm -hmm because it is in their individual interests. And we need to just recognize and see that sometimes for what it is and keep moving past. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, at times these people are brought forward by those institutions to defend yes. those institutions' viability. Yes. And, then what, and then what is our strategy? Yeah. How, how should we speak to that? So, the, the, so I think accountability. Mm. So I think one of the pieces that, because we are embattled by racism, mm. um, we are embattled by anti-black racism, is we find ourselves lost. Mike, lost. Mike. Sorry, everyone. It has disappeared. It, no, it's over here. It's over here. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I was <laughs> yeah, because we're embattled by um, anti-black racism, and in fact it is part of racism's, racism's project, is then we are leery about critiquing each other and holding each other accountable mm -hmm. for, delivering, for delivering on our liberation. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the, 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 the challenge is I think we need to, we need to risk holding um, those who have occupied, who have occupied places of power and privilege. We need mm -hmm. to risk holding them accountable, particularly mm -hmm. when they are presented back to us as the ones who are there to lead our agenda mm -hmm. in these spaces. Mm -hmm. um, and. So, so, so we need to not be shy in holding them accountable, but we also need to, I think, to be mindful at the same time about how we deploy accountability. Mm -hmm. Because at the same, because it's a, it's a funny project that the system has given us these folks, yeah? To say, these are the folks who, you know, we have anointed to do these, take forward these projects um, for you. Um, we disagree because we may have some fundamental philosophical um, disagreement with their approach. But the system binds us because of anti-black racism um, in not critiquing them because the same system who gives them to us will t use that to undermine the project entirely yes. and us yes. as a community. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah? yeah. So for me, it's also about how we hold ourselves accountable for how we do that critique and how we do that accountability holding. Mm -hmm. um, but th but it is something that we still need to risk doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The way that I think about is this working again? Yeah. The way that I think about that often really is just about not allowing. Um, sometimes people that decide that they will be our, you know, our leaders is just really not allowing our own dreams of liberation to be contained by that mm -hmm. and of not allowing it to actually contain mm -hmm. what we are, what mm -hmm. the more transformative 
um, really political ideas that I think we're trying to birth into existence right now. Yeah. So I think if we really think about our broader duty, I mean, to ourselves, uh, to black people, and we think about, you know, not only our ancestors that have come before us, but our ancestors that, that will come after us, mm -hmm. we really need to think about it as really not allowing our imaginations to sort of be cloistered by those who would sort of take themselves as you know, being our leaders, but often using those moments to sort of tell us to be quiet and slow down and wait, because that will always mm -hmm. take place. So I try not to let yeah. it absorb too much of my, my energy or my anger, because I find what we really need to be doing is actually just mm. pushing ourselves to a place where we can imagine differently, right? Where mm -hmm. we're not only thinking about these small-scale reforms that will continue to have us Precisely. asking, you know, making the same demands every single decade that, um, right. you know, to not be aiming for, you know, in 20 years we have proportionate police killings, but to say, exactly. what if we actually think about a different system that didn't involve giving our massive public budget to, um, you know, to armed yeah. members of our society to police yeah. our communities, right? Yeah. So I think that we really just need to actually let ourselves have much larger dreams yeah. than those that are trying mm -hmm. to enclose them, right. um, as opposed to sort of getting stuck on, um, you know, continuing to fight these different sort of small political, um, you know, I think that obviously there are some life-saving reforms that we need to push for in the meantime, but at the same time, yeah, absolutely, I think it's just really a matter of keeping our dreams generational mm -hmm. and keeping our accountability not only to, you know, not wanting to take down somebody that looks like us in the present day, but saying what would actually inaction here or what would failing to, to think about a different way we could organize this society now, what kind of failings would that then pass on to the children of my children of my children, right? Um, mm -hmm. And I think, you know, I mentioned the criminal justice system and policing, but we can also think about even in terms of, you know, the child welfare system now, right? Which at this point, it's about $60,000 a year to keep a child mm -hmm. in state care. But mm -hmm. that's like double what most families make. So what would it mean to actually dream of a totally different kind of family support when we know that some families do need support and some kids, some parents are not able to parent their children, but what would it actually mean for us to dream differently? And I think right. that it's really just a matter of not letting those dreams, not mm -hmm. letting those dreams die, and not letting anybody tell us that we cannot yeah. have those dreams. And, and keeping the, keeping those dreams generative in a way, which brings me to the question of like, what what is the place that we are trying to live in? Yeah, yeah. Um, those of us who don't simply see uh, see mere equality as a goal, because equality to what mm -hmm. um, yeah. might be the question? Um, is it equality in the right to kind of consume as against the? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like so. What is the place we're trying to live in? <laughs> as, a, as, a, as, an, as an opening, like what is the place we are trying to live in? You know, the um, uh, the African American chief still in Montreal, actually, Mariam Akaba, yeah. mm -hmm. says that all you have to do is, like, people think it's really difficult to imagine a. Um, let me see. Hang on, I wrote I wrote it down. Yeah, she says that people say. That she says, we don't have to go too far to see what a world without predictive policing uh, looks like. We just have to go to a white neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, that yes. they, yeah. There's yes. not. Yeah. Yes, totally. Yes. And, yes. you know, where they have, like, yes. you know, yes. all the amenities yeah. for um, producing yeah. a, a good life, for, yeah. for, for, for generating, you know, um, uh, free living in a way. Mm -hmm. um, or, or go to a predominantly white school. And you'll see like the music and the you know yeah. all of those things, all the things that you that you build a good person with, yeah. <laughs> right? Yes. <laughs> that yes. are yeah. you know that are deployed, that are funded, yes. etc. And instead, in in our cases, in in terms of schools, what they do is they put a, a cop in the school, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. they bolster the institutions, the very institutions that serve as a kind of oppressive force, give it more money to to, to deal with us in a sense. So. What am I asking? What, what is the place we want to live in and, and, and how do we make it here? Mm -hmm. sure. yeah. Yeah. In so a preliminary way. Like, yeah, yeah, so for me, in a preliminary way, I come, to, I come back to the, the comment that you made about the white neighborhood and that what do we want, what is it that we're working for, um, that we're working for the young black people we see um, who come to our various services to be without fear, mm -hmm. to be black and in their black skin claiming that, claiming their place as human without fear. Mm -hmm. um, and we know that that exists for white children who joyride. Yeah. 
in that. You go to a school where people kind of love them and want them to do really well. Yes. I, I've often thought that's all. Yes. It's very that's minimal. It's, it's, ve minimal. it's very simple. Yeah. It's very simple. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think we are oftentimes positioned yeah. as we want too much. Yeah. 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 So we want too much funding. We want, you know, um, big investment. And I'm saying, no. Yeah. No. No. I want the same investment that you have for white children to live healthy lives, to have good health, to have long life, and that when trouble visit their door, that they are afforded the same consideration about youth and the mistakes of youth. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Black children, black young people, are not afforded that privilege. So I want that to be a right, not a privilege. Yeah, that, that, that young black people could uh, uh, um, inhabit the category of children. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. yes, because that For young black time. girl yeah. who was taken out, suspended four times, age four, taken out in handcuffs and ankle cuffs at six by police, yeah. Like, tell me where that makes sense. Yeah. Where well, it makes sense in, yes. Yeah. yeah. And only in the legacy of a place that used to consider children property and not human beings, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So I don't want, to, I, I, I'm not asking for um, a, 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 a ministry department. Um, mm -hmm. I'm saying the resource that you have there. Yeah. Put that it up you, in That here. you're dedicating elsewhere yeah. to make other people feel safe, I want that same investment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want that same resource afforded to me and my communities. Yeah. Simple. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, something, I, I really agree with all of that and something that I would maybe just want to add to it too mm -hmm. is um, I think when I start to think about the word equality, that's when, again, this idea of critical resistance really comes back to me, and I think I really need to take it almost back to this global scale again, because when we talk about, um, you know, the kind of disparities that we're seeing in Canada, and again, I think if we dream small and think about sort of being equal to, um, you know, say, white middle class families or things like that, we're not sometimes looking at this broader issue, which is, of course, that the wealth of Canada is in part dependent on the poverty mm -hmm. of the countries that so many mm -hmm. of us are from, mm -hmm. right? So I think if we really go back to the sort of mm -hmm. really extractive logic, logics of capitalism, we need to also remember that only equality, again, I think isn't something that um, I want to allow myself to stop to, and I think we really need to, again, think through this larger transformative issue, because mm -hmm. if we think about the fact that people continue to be displaced to mm -hmm. here, um, I also want to envision a world in which, you know, the black people that come from the countries that our families come from don't actually have to leave their homes if they, do, if they don't want to, mm -hmm. yeah. right? That this idea of this constant displacement towards what we think of as the first world is also something that we address at these root causes. You know, Canada's involvement, for example, in banking in the Caribbean, Canada's involvement in neoliberal policies in, in Africa, right? That these mm -hmm. are actually issues that are also causing um, harm against our, our families where they are and also impovering, impoverishing our families here where they are. So I think when I think about something more transformative. I need it, I need it to also yeah. involve a kind yeah. of justice that stops yes. that ongoing yeah. exploitation, yeah. as well as, yeah. I mean, just the, the, the way that resources are produced in Canada, it's so often, I mean, almost exclusively on, indig on stolen indigenous territories mm -hmm. that are still being stolen, right? Like Attawapiskat, mm -hmm. for example, exactly. and the De Beers mine, that it actually means that literally indigenous communities are being poisoned. Exactly. So I think that when yeah. we think about the kind of safety and security we want, we need to envision it in a way that's different than the logics of now, yes. which tells us that our security mm -hmm. always has to come at the insecurity of someone else. Yes. And I yes. think we really yeah. need to move towards yeah. a yeah. kind of justice that actually exists yeah. you know, for black people, not only within the limited borders mm -hmm. of Canada and with Canadian citizenship, but of actually okay. something much broader and much more in-depth mm -hmm. um, than that as well. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. And, I, and, I, and, I, and I think the the piece that when, when we get something in this system, we need to know that it sometimes come at the expense of others, it being taken away from others. And therefore, we need to always have a certain degree of disquiet about that, mm -hmm. um, and never just sit and revel in it as our right 
under the present system mm -hmm. because the, as you said, it, it's, it's not coming as equal. It's coming as a, as a subtraction from someplace else to be assigned here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, mean, I mean, I think, I think you both are right in terms of the, the necessity for a kind of revision of all categories, because to pick up your point about, you know, the, the so-called kind of refugee crisis mm -hmm. that supposedly the world is experiencing, and it's, it's, um, it's written as refugee crisis, and, and the, yeah, um, and we see the, you know, the dreadful deaths in the Mediterranean, etc. Yeah. But what it really is is something about the upheavals and the destitution that a certain kind of capitalism um, requires, mm -hmm. actually, yeah. um, requires and, and makes, right? So that um, what is happening there is capitalist accumulation on this massive, horrible level, mm -hmm. which unseats people from, 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 from where they are, uh, and they are actually you know, forced to, to flee from where they are, or um, uh, to move from, to, to move. Um, the other thing, too, I think it brings me back to thinking about the cities that we were talking about earlier and the kind of whitening of the core of the city or the corporatizing of the core of the city, which has a correlation with the police budget. Because all these people that you are now have to move to some other border have to be managed. Right? Yeah. have to be schooled, policed, mm -hmm. etc., cetera, um, and have to be made to, to, to undergo other conditions of unhumanness, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. In order for the, the, the downtown, the middle, to be human to yeah. certain kinds of populations. Yeah. So it has to, the state has to distribute a certain level of, of, inhumane, of the inhumane in order for that to happen. Yeah. So it's, it, it is kind of this exponential, mm -hmm. and, and I think what you're both pointing to is the kind of broad thinking we have to do um, when we come at, at these questions, right? Yes. The broad yes. analyses yes. that we have to make. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. yes. And, and you know, we just cannot, cannot, cannot um, subscribe to a notion that making it in this system is making it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, because at its core, it produces sites of inequality. Mm -hmm. So when we make it in the system, we need to, we also then have a responsibility mm -hmm. to use that site of privilege to name the sites of inequality and mm -hmm. to do that everyday resistance, critical resistance and activism. Mm -hmm. It comes with that responsibility. Yeah. And, it re and, and, and that, that it also requires that we hold those of us who are, quote unquote, making it in the system to mm -hmm. hold them accountable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also to recognize those, those that what you point out as those sites of inequality, those sites of inequality invariably land in this Western Hemisphere on the bodies of black yes. and indigenous peoples. Yes. Yes. That's because yes. those were the foundational yes. sites of inequality. Yeah, absolutely, in and in other way. hemispheres so, as well, yes. right? Like even if you think yeah, about exactly. Sub-Saharan Africa being hit the, mo yeah. the most harshly exactly. um, in many ways, or like the way that the, the climate change crisis is disproportionately impacting exactly. black peoples. It's along the same delineation, uh, delineations that were set up on, you know, with the logics of slavery that we're still seeing exactly. playing out in the present day as yeah. well. Yeah. So. Well, we can't stay here forever. <laughs> and <laughs> but um, we hope that this is, mm -hmm. it, it's always only a beginning. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I am uh, pleased to have been in conversation with you both and I, and I think uh, we're in good hands in general <laughs> in terms of the kind of thinking thinking through how we might live with both of you in the world. Mm -hmm. and, um, and thank you very much. And thank you. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.